Mic check, mic check, a mic, mic check, check, mic, mic check, mic check, a mic, mic check, 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 mic check. Yeah. Hi. Welcome to the I Hate Reading Podcast, the show where I read out loud. Not because I want to, but because I have to. I hate reading because I can't stand the sound of silence. I'm not good at reading, but I'm great at talking. So let's get started. Kingdom Hearts 2, Roxas's Story, Chapter 1. So, I've been putting this off forever. I started working on D&Me and releasing that, and then I just kept procrastinating. And now it's been way too long since I made a video, and I need to just start reading these every day forever. So I'm here. I haven't done this in a while, but I'm excited nonetheless. So let's do this. Roxas's story in Kingdom Hearts 2. The three-hour tutorial level that everyone has played. Let's do it. Maybe something interesting will happen in the book. Kingdom Hearts 2, the novel. Falling, falling into darkness. And a dream, a dream of you in a world without you. Memories fading, memories reborn. Roxas, seven days. So, we need a little bit of a recap. And the book is nice enough to explain who all the people are in the story. There's a man in a black cloak, a mysterious figure. It seems to be working with a man named Diz and a girl named Namine. He's always wearing his hood up, and he's trying to hide his face. We have Diz, a masked, strange man. He has bandages all over his face, red cape, and he seems to be watching over everything. We got Namine, a girl with mysterious magical powers. She seems to be able to control people's memories. We got Axel, the mysterious red-headed assassin who kicked a lot of ass in the previous story. We have King Mickey Mouse. He needs no introduction. Three new characters, Hainer, Pence, and Olette. They seem like basic-ass kids. Of course, Sora, who's now 15 and in a deep sleep in some sort of coma, trying to get his memories back. We have no idea what happened to Riku. He seems to be missing. And last, we have our hero, Roxas, a boy who lives in the town of Twilight Town. Prologue, Episode 1. After they closed the keyhole, Sora and his friends thought they would find the princesses standing at the door in Hollow Bastion, awaiting their return. But instead, they stepped through the door into a strange place shrouded in mist. Huh. Donald cocked his head. Now where are we? Sora mumbled, looking around. Then a strange sensation came over him. Ah, it seems you are special too. All of a sudden, a voice behind him. Sora turned. Who are you? He saw a man standing there alone, wearing a black cloak, looking down at Sora from behind a hood. Handsome? Goofy said uncertainly, and readied his shield behind Sora. The man seemed like Ansem, but the hood covering his face made it hard to tell who it was. Tensed for a fight, Sora and his friends glared at the mysterious figure. That name rings familiar, the man murmured, as if to himself and then spoke to Sora again. You remind me of him. What's that supposed to mean? Sora shot back, taking a stance with the keyblade. He had no idea who the man was talking about. It means you are not whole. You are incomplete. Allow me to test your strength. The man approached, gliding over the floor, and flung orbs of light from his hands. The attack struck Sora and sent him sprawling. Sora! Goofy cried running to his defense, but the man drew twin swords from his cloak and knocked Goofy back. By Raga, Thundraga, Blizzraga, Donald hurled spells at the man, but they all dissipated harmlessly without even singeing the black cloak. Impressive, said the man. This will be enjoyable. What are you talking about? Sora shouted, springing to his feet. It is beyond your comprehension for now. Until we meet again. The man replied softly. The blade disappeared from his hands. Wait, who are you? 
I am a mere shell. With that, the man vanished like smoke into the air. Still clutching the keyblade, Sora stared in confusion, and then a voice he knew spoke. Good work, Sora. He turned to find Leon standing there. Are we back? Something wrong, Sora? Leon asked, seeing him looking so bewildered. No, it's nothing. Sora grinned and ran ahead to the final battle, the fight against Ansem. When he came to, he was standing somewhere else. It was the edge of the world, or so he felt. Jagged, crumbling rocks jutted up from a dark seashore. But come to think of it, hadn't he sat in a place sort of like this? Talking about the future? A blue sea, a blue sky? The scene simply floated up in his mind, and he shook his head. That couldn't have happened. Then he glanced down at himself. He was wearing unfamiliar black clothes. A cloak, to be precise. He knew he was seeing himself for the first time, but strangely, nothing about his appearance seemed wrong. So you've arrived, said a voice behind him. He turned and saw a figure much like himself, someone wearing a black cloak, face completely hidden under a hood. His own expression was most likely concealed from the other man, too. I've been to see him. Him? He nearly asked who the other man meant, but he had a vague sense that he already knew. He bit back at the question. He looks a lot like you. Right. And I probably look a lot like him. He and I are two sides of the same coin. Who are you? He asked the other man. I'm what's left. An empty shell. Or maybe I'm all there ever was. He frowned slightly at the man's evasive reply. I meant your name. Yes. He wanted to know the name of the person standing before him. My name is of no importance. What about you? Do you remember your true name? It sounded almost like the man was taunting him. He opened his mouth to respond. To say his name. The name of the one in the very depths of his memory. My true name is... And here the story begins. Ominous? Confusing? I don't even know who's talking half the time, but it's an interesting way to start it off. It's interesting, the book starts with Sora in like a behind-the-scenes fight from Kingdom Hearts 1, and then it flashes to the actual beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2. Really interesting that that's how they wanted to frame it. Anyway, next. Chapter 1. The First Day. Under the soft light, spilling in through the window, Roxas slowly opened his eyes. Another dream about him, he mumbled, then stood up to his bed to fling the window wide open. The warm, faintly humid summer air rushed in. His chestnut hair shone honey gold in the light. From his room on the second floor, Roxas could see a broad swath of the town. A dream. Ever since the beginning of summer vacation, Roxas had been having the same dreams every night. Dreams of a vivid blue sky over a brilliant sea of the same color, and a boy named for the sky. The boy's name was Sora. Roxas murmured it to himself and blinked his blue eyes. The boy in the dream, Sora, had a smile as bright as the sky. He seems nice enough, Roxas thought, but he couldn't quite say how he felt about the boy. From a distance, he heard the bells ringing. That was the town's distinctive landmark, the clock tower above the station. The two bells that stuck out from it on each side told time to all the citizens of Twilight Town. Roxas stretched and hopped off his bed. He took off his pajamas, a plain white shirt and capris, and dressed in a white jacket and black pants before leaving his room. Roxas headed to the usual spot, an old storage space under the train tracks. His friends were already there, Hayner and Pence and Olette, chatting about something. Hey, Roxas. Olette said, noticing him. Oh, hi. Roxas looked back at his friends, each seated in a corner. Roxas, you gotta hear this too, Hayner blurted, a bit loud as usual. He wore pants and shoes with a camouflage pattern and a black t-shirt, emblazoned with a skull, and as always, his wavy, light brown hair was impeccably styled. Man, doesn't it tick you off? He said to the others. Yeah, they're just wrong, Pence agreed angrily shaking his head, though his briskly black hair didn't ruffle in the slightest. It looked coarse enough to hurt if it were to fall into his eyes. Maybe that was why he wore it bound up in a hairband. He wore an oversized baseball shirt by Dog Street, featuring the brand logo and stylized dog character, Chasing Bones. It suited his sturdy build perfectly. Cypher's gone too far this time, Olette added. Her orange tank top, with the four-leaf clover design at the hip, 
was her favorite shirt. She always regarded everyone with kindness, no matter what, even Cypher. I mean, it's true that stuff's been getting stolen around town, and we've never gotten along with Cypher, so if he wants to think we did it, I can't really blame him. What's really driving me nuts is that he's going around telling everybody that we're the thieves. Now the whole town is treating us like a bunch of criminals. Have you ever been this mad in your life? Hainer ranted all in one breath and jumped down from the wooden crate that made his usual perch, shaking a fist. Because I haven't. Nuh-uh. Never. So what to do? Hainer turned and stared at Roxas, who hadn't quite been listening. Roxas paused, surprise crossing his face. He then jumped to his feet. Um, well, we could find the real thieves. That would set the record straight. Hey, that, that sounds kind of fun, Pence said, getting out of his chair. Not quite satisfied, Hayner stuck out his lips to a point. What about Cypher? Beside him, Pence rushed to the box that they called the treasure chest and rummaged through it. First, we gotta clear our names, Roxas said. Once we find the real culprit, everyone will get off our back. Oh no, Pence looked up from the box, holding a compact camera. Now what? Hayner shot Pence a look. Offended by the interruption, they're gone, are, are gone. Roxas, Hainer, and Olat all ran to look in the box. Whoa, how, not our, are gone, Olat said, and then touched her throat, nervously looking at Roxas. Not only were their things gone, the word itself was gone. Stolen, Roxas said. Even the word got stolen. Hainer nodded and caught his eye. There's no way Cypher could have done this. Roxas nodded in reply. Okay, time for some recon. Hayner dashed out of their hangout. Pence and Olette followed him. All right. Roxas moved to catch up, and the world began spinning. Huh? The strength drained from his legs, but by the time he realized, he was crumpling to the floor. Darkness was swallowing his mind. A deep voice spoke out somewhere. His heart is returning. Doubtless he'll awake soon. But Roxas didn't know who it was. It's already been one year since I promised him, Namine thought. Sora was asleep in the flowerbud capsule. It had been a year since he went in. She looked away, down at the floor. Maybe we're just being used. Namine. Slowly she turned to face another person addressing her. The man wore a black cloak, the same as those in the organization. There was a kindness in his eyes that she glimpsed beneath the hood. Eyes that could never lie. She spent this past year doing nothing but drawing pictures. But for him, it had been a very hard year. It won't be much longer. His gaze was fixed on a sleeping Sora. Everything he'd done was for Sora and for all the world. So what about me? What am I doing here? Namine asked herself. He seems lonely, somehow, he said. I wouldn't worry. A small smile curled at the edges of Namine's mouth. She returned her attention to Sora. Soon, soon Sora will wake up. But then what will we do? And what about us? Do we have to meet the same fate as that false one? The replica? Is there no other way? Namine thought of the chestnut-haired boy, who had come into being in the same moment she had. What? What was that voice just now? Roxas looked around. He knew he'd heard someone speaking, about his heart returning. Roxas! He raised his head to see Pence peering anxiously at him. Come on, let's go! Yeah. Pence grabbed his hand and pulled him to his feet, and they left a space under the tracks. Outside was a sloping back alley, leading up towards the station and down to the sandlot. Roxas, what are you doing? Hainer shouted from downhill. If they ran straight ahead, they would come to the tram common at the center of town. Hurry up! Hainer yelled again. Okay! Roxas chased after Pence. But that voice, where did it come from? And those dreams about Sora, what does it all mean? Over here! Hainer called. Roxas followed his voice through the gate and dashed into the plaza. The stillness of the room was only broken by a mechanical sound. The only light in the dim space came from the computer screens. The man headed toward one of them and typed something on the keyboard. The man's face was wrapped in red cloth bandages and black leather belts. There were things he had to record. The experiments that had led to all this. The root of all these evils was within him. Little electronic noises broke out from the room's silence. It seems that we have some contaminants, he murmured to himself. The man's name was Diz, 
It stood for darkness and zero. That was the name he had chosen for himself, and the burden he had brought upon himself. What a stupid name. My name is Darkness and Zero. You can call me Diz. Ooh, I don't remember who I am anymore, so this is my new identity. I used to be someone else, but now I'm this guy. Man, it's a long chapter. Time to get this investigation underway, Pence declared when Roxas caught up. The four of them gathered in the middle of the common to confer. Did you find out who's been robbed? Hainer asked. Sure did, replied Pence. Wallace at the item shop, Jesse at the accessory shop, Auntie Elmra at the candy shop, and that's practically everyone in town who runs a shop, Olette exclaimed. <sighs> well, I guess we have to go around and ask them one by one, Hainer said with a sigh. You're right, Roxas agreed. They headed to the item shop. Roxas, Wallace stated before any of them could get a word in. Never thought you'd do such a rotten thing. We didn't steal anything, okay? Roxas said. Wallace only shook his head. I'd like to believe you, but who else would take that stuff? Could you tell us what got stolen? Olette asked, standing beside Roxas. As if you kids didn't already know, Wallace said icily. I'm not going to talk to you. Go to the accessory shop and ask Jesse. Apparently there was no doubt in his mind that Roxas and his friends were the thieves. What a drag. Well. We better go talk to Jesse. Hainer spun on his heels and fixed his sight on the accessory shop. Pence followed suit, even if Cypher was spreading rumors about us. Didn't Wallace seem a little too convinced that we were guilty? Yeah, well, it's Cypher's fault. Why would everyone think it was us without any evidence? Pence and Olette both tilted their heads and thought. Hey, are all of us suspects or is it just me? Roxas wondered aloud. Saying you are is the same as saying all of us are. Hayner clenched his fist. It's not like I like you or anything. But, dejected, Roxas lowered his head. I just want to clarify, he didn't say, it's not like I like you or anything. I'm just saying, it seems that way. Wallace definitely suspected me, and no one else. That's right, Pence said. Besides, you'd never be able to steal things on your own without getting caught. I guess so. Hey, what's that supposed to mean, Pence? When Roxas looked up, Pence covered his head with retaliation and sprinted ahead. Well, it's true, Olette giggled. There's just no way you could pull off anything so scandalous. She took off after Pence. Ah, uh, come on, you too, Olette? Roxas complained and chased after them. Hey, wait for me. Hainer ran to catch up. The four of them stopped short outside the accessory shop. Oh, it's you, Roxas. The voice behind the counter belonged to the pretty shopkeeper, Jesse. I wish you wouldn't let me down. You used to be one of my favorite customers. I'm not the thief. Roxas felt that he was repeating himself. It hurt to be presumed guilty like this. But there's no one else who would steal those things, Jesse said. Roxas hung his head. Hainer spoke up behind him. Roxas says he didn't do it. <sighs> well, it doesn't really matter. Jesse let out a small sigh. What got stolen? Can you tell us anything? Olette asked persistently. Jesse's shoulders sagged, as if she didn't want to talk about it. Anyway, you'll have to find a way to clear your name. Elmira at the candy shop is pretty disappointed, too. Let's go, Roxas. Pence gently pushed him away from the counter. Apparently convinced there was no point in asking any more questions, the four of them trudged to the candy shop. Not a thief, Roxas mumbled. We know that. That's why we're asking around, isn't it? After all, we were robbed, too. Hayner gave him a friendly thump on the back as they ran to the counter. Hey, Auntie. Elmira looked up. Oh, hello there, Hayner. He sold ice cream for you, she said in her slow, easygoing way. We wanted to ask if anyone stole things from you, Hainer said. The others clustered around him, all of them watching Auntie Elmira. Oh my, yes, something important, she replied, and the black cat perched on her lap softly meowed. Meow? Just so you know, we didn't do it, Roxas suddenly declared. Auntie Elmira looked squarely at him. I believe you, she told him warmly with a faint smile. Thank you, ma'am, Olette said. So what did they take from you? I can't say the word, but my precious... She sounded mournful. They took ours, too, Pence cried. So the culprit is going around stealing, and not just... But the word, too, Hainer said, looking at Roxas. He nodded. But why would a thief steal... I wonder if Cypher knows anything about it, Olette murmured. We'll have to go ask him, Roxas said. The other three nodded. Thanks, Auntie Elmira, 
They waved to her and took off to the sandlot. That's a perfect time for a break. Hey, how's the show going? I think it's going fine, but this is a long one. It's exhausting. You have no idea how much I had to cut out of this one. Anyway, if you like this show, you should check out my other stuff. Not a lot of people watch D&Me, and I get it, it wasn't that great. But I have like a bunch of channels. So if you want to see other stuff I make, check out my link tree. It's on the bottom of every video. And it basically just shows you everything I make. I don't know. It could be interesting. But I hope you're having fun with this one. I know this is a very small audience, but I still make it. Even though I really do hate reading. I hope you're enjoying the suffering. Anyway, back to the book. Thieves. Thieves. Fu's voice sounded from the sandlot. The moment she saw Roxas and his friends. That was real low, you know? Rye added. Oh yeah? Hainer ran straight down to them. In the sandlot stood Fu, a slender girl with a piercing gaze, who spoke strangely in clipped phrases. And Rye, a brawny boy who had nothing but the greatest respect for Cypher. With them was Vivi, a timid boy who seldom said a word. This trio was Cypher's... This trio was Cypher's retween. Retween? 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 This trio was Cypher's crew. You better take that back, Hainer shouted. He was on the verge of tackling Rye when Cypher strode onto the scene from the path leading to Station Heights. Nice comeback. Hainer jumped and spun around. What did you say? But Cypher brushed past Hainer to face Roxas. You can give us back the... Now? I didn't steal it, Roxas said, glaring back. You're the only one who would, Rye retorted from behind his hero. It was our proof that we totally whooped you, Cypher went on. So what'd you do? Burn it? Not like getting rid of that would change the fact you're losers. Rematch? Fu declared. Rye laughed loudly. <laughs> yeah, that'll be rich. If you surrender now, I might just let it slide, Cypher said with a healthy dose of swagger, and he drew the toy sword that was his weapon of choice. Roxas, Olette called nervously, but Roxas stepped closer and knelt down. He lowered his head. <laughs> Begging for forgiveness, Rai taunted. Instead, Roxas picked up another toy sword from the ground and swung it at Cypher. Hey, are you for real? Yeah, I am. The two boys battled for a bit, until Roxas knocked Cypher's sword from his hands. He glared at Cypher as he tried to catch his breath. <sighs> Hainer jumped up and cheered. All right, Roxas. As if he took the wind out of his sails, Cypher simply walked away, leaving his sword where it had fallen in the dirt. Cypher's just... Not feeling so hot, you know, said Rye. Tournament decides, Fu added. They followed Cypher, and then Vivi toddled after them. Nice work, Roxas. Pence took the camera out of his pocket and aimed it. Huh? Oh, okay. Seeing the lens trained on him, Roxas struck a victorious pose and grinned. The shutter clicked. Click! And that instant, something appeared out of nowhere and swiped Pence's camera. Whoa! Startled, Pence fell backwards. The thing that held the camera was some kind of creature that they'd never seen before, gleaming silver and writhing strangely, like a mirage that warped the air around it. What's that? Hainer yelped as the thing slinked and hopped away toward the alley that led to the plaza below. The thief! cried Olette. Still clutching the toy sword, Roxas ran after it. Hey, slow down, Roxas! He heard Hainer call, but he wasn't about to stop. This is the thief. Roxas was absolutely certain of it. The weird creature dashed out of the sandlot, then cut across the tram common. It was ridiculously fast. It slithered into a hole in the wall at the edge of the plaza. Is it headed for that haunted mansion? He muttered as he ducked through the hole into the dim, quiet woods. In the woods, there was a huge old house where no one lived. Haunted, supposedly. The thing seemed to be moving steadily towards a gap in the trees, where Roxas could just barely see the lighter path ahead. It stopped in front of the mansion gate. Roxas lifted his toy sword and crept closer to it. But the thing suddenly froze still. And at the same time, Roxas heard a voice that seemed to speak directly into his body. We have come for you, my liege. Huh? Roxas blurted. That thing rushed at him. Ugh! He swung at the winding, writhing creature. He was sure he'd made contact. And yet the sword seemed to go right through it. It's no good. Why can't I hit it? The moment he lowered his sword, the world went askew. Not again. 
It felt like what had happened to him in the hangout, but not exactly the same. This time, there was a quiet, electronic kind of sound. It gathered around the toy sword in his hand. It looked as though there were spirals of numbers swirling around it. Huh? Before his eyes, the sword transformed into a giant key. What is this thing? The key seemed to draw him forward, moving on its own to attack the creature. Whoa. This time, when the key made contact, Roxas felt the impact. A second and a third strike. And then the strange creature vanished, like it had been an illusion the whole time. Likewise, the giant key he held changed back into wood. He had no idea what was happening. A giant key and a strange creature? Those voices from nowhere? And those dreams? Roxas! The voice was Hainer's. There on the ground, exactly where the creature had been, were a few pieces of paper. Roxas picked one up. It was a photo of himself with Wallace from the item shop. Are you okay? Pence called out. Olette joined them a moment later. Yeah, look. Roxas held up the picture. Are these the ones that got stolen? Hainer said, peering at it. I, I think so. Pence and Olette gathered the other photos. Well, it looks like this is all the missing stuff, Pence said, picking up his camera. Back to our usual spot? Olette suggested. Yeah, Roxas nodded. Meanwhile, a gathering of men in black cloaks sat in a grand hall of shining white marble. Their hoods hid their faces, making their expressions unreadable. There were seven of them, and their seats were according to some kind of numbered order. Six seats were empty. Numbers four, five, six, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. It seems we've found him at last, the man in seat one said in a deep voice. Roxas? asked the man in seat two. Or the hero? Both. Number eight looked away from number one's high seat and shrugged. Another man slowly shook his head, both of them at once. That's impossible. Another man slowly shook his head. Both of them at once? That's impossible. So someone's will is in action, murmured another. It seems like him, number one rumbled. Who? Number nine cocked his head. The man in seat three spoke for the first time. It can't be. Number nine leaned over his neighbor in seat ten. Wait, who are you talking about? He asked, intensely curious. Be quiet. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, Axel. Shut down by number ten. Number nine tried to turn to number eight. And then number 67 looked at number 32 and said, Why are there so many goddamn numbers? Why can't they just say their goddamn names? I know that it's a mystery and we don't know who they are. And all the organization members are numbered. But I'm not going to go look up who number six is and who number four is and then do the voice specifically for them. It's very annoying to have to read. Whatever. Whatever. In seat eight, Axel crossed his arms and said nothing. Number nine gave a dramatic sigh. <sighs> what, you two? Enough, Demix. That was number two. The time to act is upon us, number three said. A slight frown tugged at Axel's brows. What if he'd been able to stop Roxas back then? If he had told Roxas all the things they kept secret, maybe it wouldn't have come to this. But he's been unable to betray the organization. No. He had definitely betrayed them. The one that killed everyone in the castle, who led Riku to Namine. That was him. And yet it wasn't a total betrayal. Doubts still swirled inside him. Why am I here? What do I want? How can I become whole again? Even now he wasn't sure. What should I have done? What should I do? Roxas. We have to discuss strategy, Axel. Startled at being called upon, Axel raised his head. You're the one who knows the most about Keyblade wielders, number two said. Axel nodded. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, back in their nook, the four friends looked at the photos one by one. What's going on in this photo, Hainer wondered. A grin came to Olette's face. You just said photo. The stolen things and the stolen word had been recovered. Roxas eyed the photo in Hainer's hand. It's me and Wallace. I was his first customer after he took over the shop, so we took a picture together. Photos are memories. Olette inspected another one. You look happy in this one, Roxas. This picture showed Roxas with Jesse from the accessory shop. With a girl? Hainer leaned in to see the photo and whistled. So anybody else notice that all the stolen pictures are of Roxas? Pence remarked a little nervously, examining the other pictures. Huh? Really? Olette peered at all the photos fanned out in Pence's hand. It was true. Roxas was in all of them. So that's why they thought it was us. 
You mean Cypher didn't go around accusing us after all? Hayner said. What about the real thief? Who was it? Roxas shook his head. I don't know. The pictures were just lying there. He couldn't really say what the weird creature was. All he knew was a lot of strange things were happening to him. Then how do we prove we didn't take him? Hayner said, stumped. Well, all the pictures were of him. What if the thief actually wanted to steal the real Roxas? Pence teased. Get real. Why would anyone want to steal a bonehead like him? Methinks the lady doth protest too much. I said that, not the book. Why would the book say that? Get real. <laughs> Excuse you, Roxas jokingly raised a fist. Uh, no. Hayner covered his head. Oh, hey, guys. There's a picture of all of us. Olette held up a photo of the four of them in front of the haunted mansion. Yeah, I look pretty good, huh? Hayner said. Not seeing it, Pence laughed. Beside them, Roxas stared at the picture. Right, that picture of us all together is important. Except he couldn't remember when they'd taken it. From across town, they heard the bells ringing. Time to get going, huh? Olette said. The boys nodded. I'll go give everyone's photos back on the way. See you tomorrow. Hayner left, clutching all of the pictures. Okay, later. Olette and Pence followed him out. Roxas was the last to leave. Twilight Town's setting sun shone in his eyes. So bright, Roxas closed his eyes. And instantly, the world was dark. Where am I? He heard a voice inside his head. Who's there? Roxas asked. Who are you? It was a voice he'd heard before. It was... Restoration at 12%. Diz felt a presence behind him, but he didn't turn away from the monitor. It was Organization 13 miscreants. They've found us. The man in the black cloak peered over Diz's shoulders at the boy's face on the screen. Why would the nobody steal photographs? Both are nothing more than data to them. The fools could never tell the difference. We are running out of time. Tell Namine she must hurry. He nodded once in reply and left to speak to Namine, leaving the sterile, inorganic room and ascending the stairs back to the old mansion. Hardly anyone ever came in here, and the air was musty. But at the end of the hall on the second floor was her room. When he opened the door, Namine felt his presence too, and she closed her sketchbook to hide the drawing she was working on. The room did not match the rest of the house. It was all white, just like that castle. What were you drawing? He asked, and went to the window. The castle? Oh, well, time's running out. Namine looked up and stared at him, but he did not look back. I promised, she murmured. Oh, nothing. You, you were the one that chose not to sleep. And Sora, sleeping. I promised you both, but maybe I wasn't able to keep that promise to you. Namine held her sketchbook to her chest and stood up. Dun dun dun. Is the deep-voiced man someone we know? Who do you think the deep-voiced man is? Maybe it's someone familiar. Someone who chose not to sleep at the end of the last story. Maybe it's pretty fucking obvious who it is with that line. I don't know. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's chapter one. It was long. There was a prologue beforehand. This is the first one I've done in a while, so it was very rough for me. My recording was about an hour long so far. I went back and edited the entire first half, but now there's even more to edit. Yippee, yahoo, wahoo. I can't wait to listen to myself read a book that I just read of a game that I've played 50 times. The things I do for you people. It's exhausting. I hope you really enjoy this. Anyway, next time we will read the second day, and for the rest of this season, we will read all of Roxas' story in its entirety. There is some interesting stuff in here so far, some things I never really caught when I played the original game, and it could be interesting as it goes. So we will see how it all turns out, and I'm going to try to read one a day, even though it's exhausting. I don't know how I read seven of these in a week. It's fucking crazy. Not even seven in a week. I read seven in like three days. I don't know how I do these incredibly passionate and insane things the first time, and then I have to back it up again, and I'm like, I can't do it. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I'm Aloni. Bye. <laughs>
He swung at the winding, writhing creature, 